So I'll just uh, introduce uh, you briefly, and then you can start uh, your presentation. Okay. 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 And my camera and uh, audio. Pardon me. So, okay. So we'll be handling uh, the YouTube live, and uh, I'll be introducing participants. Okay. So uh, I we I think we are live on YouTube now. So uh, okay. so we welcome. you on behalf of uh, gujarat forensic sciences university on behalf of my uh, director uh, on behalf of my dg sir and my hod of food department uh, jairad sir and we look forward to an informative session from your side and we look forward to learn a lot and uh, food forensics is a comparatively new domain for a lot of participants i have uh, a brief uh, i know about it because that was my uh, masters uh, subject and for a lot of uh, new students it is uh, it is a very broad new subject that they are inquisitive to learn about so the seat is all yours sir and we look forward to learn a lot from you okay thank you so much for this opportunity and i'm looking forward to talk about some of the things that we do here in uh, uh, oklahoma state university and if you have any question or concern please stop me any time i'm more than happy to i think uh, uh, we'll take the questions after your presentation we'll okay. be handling questions and at the end okay. of the session uh, we'll take the questions okay great uh, can yes. you see my slide yeah we can okay uh, okay yes you you can okay great yeah. okay so I'm Ravi Jadeja. Work at Oklahoma State University. Uh, let me talk about a very brief introduction of myself. That uh, I received my B.Sc. and M.Sc. degrees from Sardar Patel University, Gujarat, in biotechnology and food biotechnology. Received my Ph.D. from food science, with a food science concentration in Louisiana State University in U.S. And uh, been working in uh, academia since then. So uh, I was. postdoctoral researcher at LSU uh, and my focus was uh, seafood safety at that time then i worked as a postdoctoral researcher at university of georgia and again uh, was meat safety that was my main concentration at that time since 2015 i'm working with uh, oklahoma state university as an assistant professor and food safety specialist uh, food safety specialist is one of my title that uh, came with uh, Uh, the job the reason that uh, that title is there because oklahoma state university has a specific program called uh, food sector assistance program through extension and uh, if uh, there is someone who is involved in that program and providing help to oklahoma stakeholders regarding the food safety regulations and implementation of food safety program then this is the title that uh, it's official title that you receive a little bit more information about uh, oklahoma state university our university was founded in 1890 it's a public university located in uh, stillwater oklahoma uh, in united state we have a little over 25000 student and uh, those student came from all 50 states of us and 100 different countries uh my department where i work uh, this department was established in 1989 the main responsibility of this organization or this department is to provide training and assistance to oklahoma food industry we have 96000 square foot usda fda and health department inspected processing facility and what does that mean that means any food product that we produce in our department we can sell legally in the us and uh, since the start of our program we have worked on 2000 major client projects and each year we provide about 90 trainings and train 3000 industry professionals and there are so many different types of trainings we provide it is somewhat difficult for me to list all of those but uh, here i'm just listing some training which in which i'm involved in if you are interested you can always check out www.fapc.biz for more information so without any further ado let's just dive into food fraud issue what is food fraud well when you have intentional substitution or dilution or addition of product or raw material to gain financial gain or reduce 
the cost of production that is called food fraud. Again, we will go through some historical uh, incident. We will also talk about the list of uh, most susceptible ingredient for food fraud. And I have a list from 2019, so that is fairly new. And then we will talk about some of the strategies that we can use to reduce food fraud incidents. <clears throat> Excuse me. So food fraud is a global problem. And uh, I'm sure that uh, growing up, I have always heard that we need to be careful when you are buying ghee or some, some sort of spices because it might be adulterated or it might be diluted with something to gain some financial support. And then on top of that, uh, there are similar incident you are going to find worldwide. In 2013, there was a big incident that shook the foundation of meat industry in the US and European country. That uh, people started finding horse DNA, that means horse meat in beef and other type of food product. And uh, <clears throat> that was a big problem because horse is considered uh, a pet animal and uh, people are not supposed to consume horse meat, especially in US. And in fact, US government provide uh, funding to take care of the horses for their entire life. So you will find big ranches, about like 100,000 uh, acres of ranch. Uh, people are just going to keep horses there and they're going to just roam free. And, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, for the entirety of their life and government will provide funding to support that type of practice. But in some European countries, Japan, uh, people do consume horse meat and uh, because of the demand is low, horse meat is somewhat cheap. And because of that, uh, there were some incident that uh, uh, some companies have accidentally and intentionally, in many cases, adulterated uh, other meat product with horse meat. Uh, food Protection and Defense Organization estimate that 10% of the US food supply is adulterated and the cost of that adulterated food product varies between 10 billion to $15 billion per year in United States alone. <clears throat> Another example that I would like to share is in 2012, there was a big influx from pomegranate related food product or pomegranate related uh, uh, beverages. And that increase was 13% increase. But uh, when you see this much increase, that put a huge pressure on your supply chain. You need to have more and more ingredient uh, delivered to food processing facilities for them to make new products out of it. But one major issue with this thing is that pomegranate tree takes about three years from plantation to produce fruit. So there were not in a pomegranate. So some of the companies that we work with here, they had reported that they receive ingredient with a questionable quality and they suspected that those ingredients were not right. They were able to resolve that issue by quickly changing those ingredient and then getting new ingredients from more reputable supplier. But uh, this is a prime example that what's going on in the market. And when there is a pressure on a supply chain, there is a likelihood that you may get adulterated ingredient. This is an incident in uh, uh, China in 2015. BBC News reported that uh, Chinese authorities have seized 40 year old meat from freezer. And uh, what they were doing is that they were mixing this meat at low rate with the fresh meat and they were selling this meat uh, to Chinese population or in China. And uh, why this is important? Because if you feel that uh, uh, this is not a big issue, think about a uh, situation like now. If you have heard that in US, meat processing facilities are under tremendous pressure because of COVID-19. There are approximately 5,000 employees from across the uh, US 
who are working in the meat processing industry got sick because COVID-19. And because of that, many industries needed to shut down their operation. And uh, because less production, prices are going up and people are trying to make a quick buck by adulterating the meat product. So if you are a vegetarian here, then, then there is another issue because there are some testing done in uh, 2015 and people have identified that uh, vegetarian product, uh, typically sausage and uh, other burger product that uh, those are commonly available here, those came under the label as this, these are the vegetarian product. They were not vegetarian. It had uh, some sort of animal product present in them. So I'm assuming that uh, probably they might have contaminated the product with meat or beef product. Now this list is from 2019. Uh, you can see that number one product that was most adulterated was seafood. Uh, followed by dairy ingredient, meat and poultry beverage, alcoholic beverages. So typically alcoholic beverages, you will find that when people are trying to buy more expensive wine, uh, you will have adulterated wine. That means someone is going to dilute those wine or someone is completely give you a wrong bottle of wine with the, the more expensive wines label and bottle in it. And it's going to be an issue. Herbs include spices. Unfortunately, uh, spices originated from Southeast Asia are prime target for this type of incident. Vegetable oil, honey, uh, olive oil, beverages, and grains are the top 10 most adulterated ingredient in 2019. And again, this list changes slightly but you will see that most of the ingredients listed over here are going to be part of uh, that most adulterated ingredient list uh, since like uh, since 2001 and it's going to be part till like even next 20 30 years unless something changes significantly and uh, because of uh, this type of incident now people are required that if you are buying this type, uh, like one of these top 10 ingredients, you need to have additional security and you need to prove to government regulators as well as third party auditors that your product is safe. Now you may ask question that what is third party audit? We all know that regulators uh, regulations are there and regulators are going to be there to check the quality and safety of your food product. But uh, though regulations are there, Supply, uh, big customers like Walmart, Costco, uh, McDonald's, they feel that regulation alone cannot provide sufficient protection against food safety and quality issue. So what they used to do, and now things are a little bit different, that uh, they used to send out their own team to their uh, supplier and then that their team will audit that supplier independently, and they will have their own uh, criteria. And uh, in 2002, according to a leading food safety magazine, there were about 135 different supplier audits were out there. So if in ideal world, you would have just one customer and you will have just one audit, but that is only happen in uh, ideal world, dream world. Typically, food companies here will have at least three to five big customer. So because of that, they used to prepare themselves for at least five different audits on top of all of the regulatory audits that they need to go through. So that was causing lots of pressure on the companies over here because each audit had a somewhat similar requirement, but the write-up was different. They were asking them to follow a very similar a pattern of food safety program development, but uh, they had their own terminology that they wanted to see. So it was not very uncommon that you will see five different food safety binders in each of the companies that uh, like I work with. And uh, every time they have audit going, they are going through the audit, they are going to bring the binder that is relevant to that particular audit. It put lots of pressure on the food industry because it is like the same thing you are doing over and over again, uh, but you are changing the word slightly. So it create more confusion. 
And each audit is going to cost you anywhere from $5,000 to $7,000. So now you are spending a lot more money with five different audits. So tackle this issue, uh, Walmart, uh, Costco, and like one of these big retailers and uh, food service providers came together and decided that they will come up with their own standard. But then they realized that if they come up with their own standard and uh, the company that they are dealing with are all, is also selling the food product to other companies or other customer who are not part of this group, they may still need to uh, comply with multiple food safety scheme. So in order to ease that pressure, what they decided that instead of auditing the company, they will audit the existing food safety standard. They came up with their guidance document and invited all of the existing 136 uh, schemes to compare their requirement with the guidance document that uh, GFSI, Global Food Safety Initiative uh, Group came up with. And uh, when they compared, there were few who were comparable, the, all, some of the few schemes who, requirements were comparable to the GFSI guidance document and they were accepted as a GFSI benchmark standard. Again, there are very few that I'm listing over here. There are many, I think right now there are about uh, 13 different schemes which are part of GFSI benchmark standard. But in US, we will see most of the food company are going after SQF uh, followed by BRC and the finally, uh, FSSA 22,000 schemes. And I'm assuming that this is also true for India as well, because I have heard that many of my friends who are working in the food company there, uh, they need to follow or comply with one of these schemes. The situation is uh, getting stricter and stricter here. Uh, even I work with the very small companies with four and six employees, and now they are required to even have third-party audit. And uh, if you have some experience developing third-party audit program, you know that these programs are quite extensive and uh, for very small company, it can be very difficult to comply because uh, amount of paperwork that you need to do is tremendous. So as I mentioned that Global Food Safety Initiative time to time uh, publish their guidance document. And that guidance document from issue seven, now they are focusing on food fraud because food fraud was not initially part of uh, uh, the food safety plan or the requirement that uh, GFSI was asking all of the companies to comply with, but now it is because food fraud is a big issue. And uh, once this requirement is in place, all of the benchmark scheme, SQF and BRC, need to comply with this requirement as well. So now what is required? That we need to assess all raw material for vulnerability to food fraud. And on top of that, we also need to make sure that we put risk-based controls to reduce the adulteration risk. So how we help food industry? Well, uh, there is one aspect that we need to work with the labs. We need to work with the organization who can assess the purity of our ingredient. But there are certain things that we also need to do from the food industry side. We need to develop a food safety and food fraud plan. So in the presentation from now onwards, I will be talking about how food industry can develop a VASEP, a vulnerability assessment critical control point plan to tackle uh, food fraud issues. But before I go any further, I want to emphasize that there are multiple ways to handle food fraud. I give you one example of VASEP or vulnerability assessment and critical control point. That's one th thing or one approach that you can use to reduce food fraud. There is another approach. It's called TASEP, threat assessment and critical control point or CARVER. So those approaches are also acceptable because, but um, the VASEP approach is very popular here in US, at least among uh, the clients that I work with. So um, I'll be only focusing on that approach. 
So what we need to do when we are trying to identify any type of risk associated with our ingredient, especially uh, food fraud related risk, we need to list all of our ingredient first. Now we need to evaluate the risk and we will talk about uh, some steps that we need to take. Uh, first, we need to understand if that ingredient is a high risk ingredient. And that information can change anytime. All of a sudden, you hear that uh, olive crop in uh, Italy and some other country failed. And, be and because of that, you will find that uh, olive oil is more likely to get adulterated because there are not enough olive and there is a huge demand for olive oil. And uh, the second thing we need to do is that what type of control we can put in on place. We can ask for COAs. When I say COAs, it's a certificate of analysis. And the common practice here uh, in the US with different companies, that if they suspect that there is something wrong with the food safety or food quality wise, they are going to request certificate of analysis for those ingredient when people are going to send those ingredient uh, to the food industry. So we need to put those controls in place and we need to record findings that uh, after placing those control, if we can still effectively control the risk of uh, uh, food adulteration, and then after that, review and verify uh, as appropriate. And we will be talking about uh, some of this step in upcoming slide. So I'm not spending too much time on this, present, uh, this slide itself but if you have any question at the end of the presentation please feel free to reach out and i'm more than happy to answer uh, or clarify any of the points that we have discussed uh, on this slide okay this slide is going to talk about things that we need to consider first of all raw material so if you remember I have presented 10 most adulterated ingredients. So if you have found uh, that you are buying one of the ingredients from those top 10, that, that uh, top 10 list, then in that case, you need to be careful. You need to make sure that uh, you have effective controls in place. You may have some control in place. For example, uh, you are getting COAs with uh, each batch of the food product. You are also uh, getting some sort of third party audit for your supplier. And uh, you know that supplier for 10, 15, 20 years, and you never had any issue with that supplier, then because of that trust, you can reduce the, the potential risk associated with food adulteration for that ingredient. But uh, if you are buying your food product from brokers, that means they can source product from anywhere and then they can ship that product to you then in that type of situation, your product might be a little bit more susceptible to contamination or adulteration. And uh, one thing that you need to do is that you need to observe food fraud incident. Again, this list is from uh, 2019. Uh, out of all of the incident that occurred in, uh, uh, in around the globe, uh, like if you see the country with the darker color is going to have the most number of incident. So as you can see that uh, India, Pakistan, uh, that area is very dark in color. That means many ingredient originated from that area were contaminated. And some of the examples are sp spices being adulterated with uh, allergens. Uh, one of the very recent uh, incident where people received cumin powder contaminated with peanut shell powder because their colors are very similar. You can probably pass the peanut shell powder as a cumin powder if you mix it at certain level. But in US, there are eight major allergen and peanut allergy is a, a probably, I would say number one cause for uh, death and illnesses occurred due to uh, consumption of uh, consumption of uh, allergen, and uh, it is considered very serious allergy. And uh, there are some incident where people consume peanut containing food product by mistake, and within a couple of hours they died. So 
if I'm producing a food product and uh, if I'm buying a cumin powder, and I don't know that if that cumin powder is contaminated with uh, peanut shell powder, then I may end up producing a food product that is contaminated or laced with uh, peanut powder and may end up hurting someone who is going to consume food product and who is allergic to peanut because I don't know that peanut might be present in my food product and that's why I don't have it on label. And if someone who is allergic to a certain type of ingredient, the only protection they have is to read the label and make sure that food product they are consuming is not going to cause harm to them. So, uh, that was one point that we need to look for origin of ingredient where those ingredients are coming from uh, we need to look for supply chain that uh, how many places that ingredient change hand so for example uh, someone who is producing spices and if that person is directly selling the, those ingredients to you the likelihood of that ingredient being contaminated or adulterated is less because there are not many steps in between but uh, if someone is producing spices, is going to sell that, sp uh, that those spices to a middleman. Middleman will sell it to someone else, and then finally, those spices will end up in broker's hand. Broker broker will import in U.S. And then here you are going to get those spices. Then likelihood that uh, that uh, product may be adulterated is high because the product went through many hands and there are more places the product goes through more likelihood that uh, that product may get contaminated with so there are different type of websites that you can uh, follow and those websites typically list uh, incident of uh, food fraud, those websites will also provide if certain supplier is in question, certain the broker is in question. Uh, one of the big example I can share is honey related issue. I believe in uh, early uh, 2011 or 2012, uh, there was a big FBI raid where they caught people from a broker company because they were trying to push honey from China that was contaminated with antibiotics. And not only that was an issue because they were getting their honey that was produced in China, but it was labeled that it came from Thailand and other countries. So in US, there is an anti-dumping duty on uh, Chinese honey. I believe it's about like $2 per pound. And uh, uh, how people try to avoid that anti-dumping duty is that uh, Chinese honey will be shipped off to uh, Thailand or other different countries, and they will get a new label that, that uh, this honey was produced in other Southeast Asian countries, and then uh, honey will be shipped back to US so that they don't need to pay uh, anti-dumping duty. So that wasn't an issue, and many times uh, people will have antibiotics and even uh, antibiotics in seafood is a big issue. So people try to send out uh, seafood, especially shrimps, containing antibiotics to US and uh, FDA time to time uh, catch the, those batches and uh, basically destroy that those products. But uh, when they do that, it also hurt the reputation of country who is shipping those type of contaminated product over here. And because of that, uh, we have found that uh, seafood and uh, some of the spices imported to US, especially if it, uh, those things come from Southeast Asia, uh, there is an increased scrutiny from supplier as well as the regulatory agencies. So once you have that information in place, uh, you develop a food safety plan. Let me just go ahead and show you a form that we typically ask food companies to use. Again, you can see that we list ingredient, we name the supplier, and then we conduct the assessment. In the assessment, we will try to identify the specific risk associated of uh, consequences and likelihood for food adulteration. And uh, based on our assessment, we go through different websites. I have mentioned those. And if you find that uh, this product is more likely to be adulterated, then we put specific control 
in place. Those control could be your uh, COAs, your, that control could be like receiving ingredient and making sure that uh, we send those ingredients out for uh, uh, further testing to make sure that those ingredients were actually what they are, uh, they're being sold. And uh, on top of that, we work with the supplier to make sure that their third party audit program is up to date. And there are some other steps that we take and we will, uh, I will talk about those steps in upcoming slide. Um, the other thing that once you have your vulnerability assessment, we need to keep that assessment in good shape. And uh, according to GFSI schemes, like any food safety program that you are using, SQFBS, your FSSC, you must review your vulnerability assessment at least once a year. And uh, if there are significant changes to ingredient, if there are changes to uh, process, if you change your supplier, if you change the country where you are getting your product from, then in that case, you may need to change or you need to you need to reanalyze the vulnerability of your ingredient. Again, these are some situations that uh, in, in which you need to consider or you need to reevaluate the, the risk associated with vulnerability. Some more, um, one thing that you need to think about is that not only you need to rely on a supplier, but you also need to rely on scientific information that is currently being uh, broadcast or currently being available in the uh, currently, which is current. So one of the information that I would like to share is that uh, recently there were some incident here in the United States that uh, after that nuclear plant meltdown in Japan, people were catching some radioactive fishes and those fish were mixed at the very low quantity with uh, some of the other fish, those were being exported to US. Uh, it took them some time to realize that uh, this is an issue, but because of those type of incident, even there was a change in the regulation. And uh, now people are required to identify radioactive material risk in their food safety plan also. So food safety plan is typically handled separately than your vulnerability assessment or food fraud plan. But there might be some overlap because uh, sometimes when try people are trying to fool someone, they're trying to con someone by replacing ingredient, some of those ingredients can be har uh, harmful to consumers. So we have been talking about some of these things. So what we can do to prevent uh, risk associated with food fraud? Well, uh, we need to come up with a test. We need to ask a COA certificate of analysis. We need to confirm those COAs time to time by sending uh, those samples out. And uh, again, when you are buying a huge quantity of product, it would be very difficult for you to take a homogeneous sample because it is likely that the samples you take might not be adulterated, but other samples may be adulterated. So over here on the point two, you can see that uh, the, some of the testing method, which is commonly used here uh, for honey, let me tell you, I think I have not listed the method that pe people use for honey is NMR. And uh, they are trying to look for uh, pollen structure in honey. And uh, according to scientists, that pollens are as uh, unique as fingerprint. And based on the pollen structure, people can tell if that honey was originated in China or a specific country where the, they are claiming that that honey is originated from. So as I mentioned that just relying on uh, testing is not sufficient because you get huge amount of product and uh, testing can get very expensive. 
So you need to implement some additional controls and those additional control include supply chain audit, mass balance, balance exercise. So what are mass balance exercise? That means if I'm getting some ingredient and I'm telling that, oh, this is a saffron from Kashmir, then uh, I need to make sure that when I end up making all of my ingredient, I am using the appropriate amount of uh, supply of uh, Kashmir origin origin saffron from my uh, company. So if I end up using less or more, that means there is something wrong. Uh, either formulations were wrong, or uh, I might have got a situation where uh, I use contaminated product. And uh, that's why I had five kg of uh, Kash uh, Kashmir origin saffron present, and I'm supposed to use two kg in the batch that I produce. But uh, even after the the processing, I have three and a half kg left. That means there was a half kg issue, and uh, it may be possible that uh, someone might have used uh, adulterated uh, saffron and or they may have replaced that saffron with something that is not supposed to be there and they they are trying to make money even in your own company your own employees again the mass balance exercise if you just employ at your location they are not going to be that effective you need to employ mass balance exercise at your suppliers as well and your suppliers need to apply mass balance exercise at their suppliers as well so once you apply mass balance exercise throughout your chain, audit chain, the likelihood that that product will be substituted is less. Uh, we need to make sure that product don't get substituted or replaced during transportation by putting temper evidence seal. And uh, we need to make sure that we can trust that supplier. And how can we do that? Uh, there are some websites that you can go online and you can identify that uh, if that supplier had any issue with uh, food fraud related uh, food fraud food fraud related uh, uh, issues in past but uh, those websites are somewhat expensive uh, discernis is one of the website it cost about $1000 per year per company so if you are a large enough company you can just go ahead and then buy that subscription list all of your ingredient over there list all of your supplier in there and that website will give you a risk assessment for all of your ingredient and all of your suppliers and if you find that uh, some of your supplier is high risk and they tend to adulterate food product then it is wise to change your supplier and get the product from someone else when you think about what are the most effective methods, so again, we have talked about eight different approaches that you can use to reduce the risk of uh, food adulteration. The most effective way is to elimination and effective supplier approval. So that means if you have a supplier in question who is not very good and uh, with uh, questionable ethical standards, then in that case, eliminate that supplier and check for a direct supplier who is producing the food product and who has a really good track record and you are going to get a safer product and without any adulteration issue uh, from that supplier compared to if you just get the product from uh, a supplier with uh, very bad history because you may be using some test and your supplier also know that you are going to test uh, his or her food product because because of the history and uh, they may come up with some innovative way to fool the test and it can become problem for you because you might end up using that food product and uh, end up uh, hurting your consumer though it was your supplier's fault but the product that you are producing has your logo in it and uh, if people start getting hurt or they feel that they are being cheated they are not going to buy your product and you will lose your business with that again uh, this is a very complex topic uh, we do provide a whole day long training on food fraud 
but uh, this is a very, very brief overview on food fraud mitigation strategies that we teach to food industries over here. Uh, food fraud is a global issue. Different type of uh, third-party audit scheme require that we have effective food fraud uh, program in place. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, we keep our program up to date. And even if there are no issues, we need to make sure that uh, we uh, update that program, rerun the vulnerability assessment at least annually. Okay, with that, if we don't have any specific question before that, I'm just going to take the general questions at this time. Yeah, okay. So thank you for this okay. amazing session. And uh, I have some questions. Uh, first one yeah. is, how is there any difference between economically motivated adulteration and intentional substitution? So typically both are used interchangeably. Uh, like uh, the reason that I have presented over there because some of the third party audit scheme, they use the like either of the terms. So I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of both of the term. And uh, second thing, uh, some food safety schemes and especially some uh, new regulation Food Safety Modernization Act in United States, they are focused on economically motivated adulteration, but only which are going to cause uh, injury to people. So if someone decide to add, uh, say, high fructose corn syrup in honey, government has no issue against it because they feel that high fructose corn syrup is not going to hurt anyone. So, but if BRC or rescue of another GFSI scheme, they will not like it. So, okay. And uh, so we talked about food frauds at uh, you know at an industrial level. What about food frauds at farm level? And especially, how can we uh, go through the mass balance exercise at farm level? So that is a very good good question. Uh, unfortunately, like even here, people don't have a good answer for that one. Uh, so what they try to do is that they try to take. Uh, a big sample size and uh, try to identify that if the product that uh, that is being claimed as a certain product then is actually that product one of the big incident i would like to share uh, last year there was a farmer who got caught uh, he has been selling his crop as organic crop since last 12 year and uh, the amount of product that he sold never uh, made sense because he was selling thousands and thousands of tons of product and uh, there was no way with the amount of land he had he could produce the, that much amount of organic produce so eventually government uh, agencies and uh, the the buyers caught up with that one and they caught this farmer and i believe that uh, he is facing uh, 10 years in federal prison for doing yeah. this stricter laws in the us so <laughs> <laughs> So this one question, a global food safety initiative was formed by multinational companies such as Mondelez, Amazon, Coca-Cola, Nestle, McDonald's, Walmart, mm -hmm. etc. These MNCs responsible for food safety incidents coming up with protocol, protocols to ensure food safety. So shouldn't we as consumers and food safety workers be skeptical about it? Such uh, big MNCs are handling these. Uh, not MSMEs or because most of the demand is met by MSMEs, but the big uh, names have, uh, you know, taken a control over it. Well, uh, the reason that uh, it's a really good point, but we also need to understand that uh, area, like I'm just going to share an example with uh, like what we see in here in US, the one recall, because if there is an issue, someone gets sick, and that uh, sickness is traced back to the product sold by one of these big retailer, they are going to be responsible for pulling that product and then the supplier will be responsible for pulling that product. One recall, uh, the average cost here in the United States is about $3 million. So it's everyone associated with uh, that food production chain is going to lose money on that one. And uh, Many of these big retailers, uh, they are in a situation that uh, they make more money by selling more product at a cheaper price. So if they are keep losing money on different type of recall and people are not trusting them anymore in that type of situation, uh, they will lose quite a bit of business. And if they lose business, they cannot sustain their model of uh, 
um, selling more product at cheaper price, and that can hurt their uh, bottom line. So because of that, uh, they are also equally concerned that how can we, uh, how can they pro uh, provide safer food product to our consumers? So again, I understand the skepticism, but uh, they have also a vested interest that uh, people are giving them safe food product, not uh, unsafe food product. And moreover, these third-party audit schemes, these companies are just going to come up with a guidance document. That guidance document will be converted into, uh, like will be covered under uh, like SQ for BRC uh, during the benchmark process. And there will be requirement and the third party audit with, uh, auditor who is independent auditor is going to compare the company in question or who is going through the audit, uh, their food safety programs with the existing requirements. So GFSI, not necessarily directly going to get involved with uh, third party audit program. They are just going to provide a document for someone else to refer and the third party audit will done by independent third party audit supplier. And so there is so much speculation about uh, frauds related to animal meats. Uh, do you think uh, that plant meats will overcome animal meats and be more popular for consumption in the future? Yeah, certainly, because um, uh, there are certain benefits. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm from a very big animal meat producing state, so I'm going to restrain myself from talking too much about uh, plant-based meat, but, <laughs> but uh, Tyson Food is one of the four biggest meat producers in the United States. Uh, they have invested heavily, and in fact, uh, we have some work going on, uh, research work going on, on um, uh, plant-based or uh, non-animal uh, origin meat product. And uh, I feel that uh, uh, in future, definitely more and more people will move toward uh, non-animal origin or like non-traditional non meat. I would not say non-animal origin because you are still using some cells. Okay. Uh, so is there any websites to know about the food frauds from farm to folk level? Uh, there are many. So in fact, in my presentation, I had listed several of those. So uh, people can refer to those. And uh, I'm not sure that if you're recording of it, I, I'm more than happy to share yeah. my presentation with you. Yes, sir. Sure. Please do share it so that we can send it to the participants for okay. Uh, future. Okay. Uh, what if industries provide a fake COA and modify their documents and release the product and, and for their shipment, and in case they get approved in this process, and thus a consumer gets harmed, in this case, uh, like uh, how is uh, how can we as consumer uh, like have the officials check the port or uh, as consumers report this uh, problem? So typically, uh, if you see that uh, there is an issue, you can always reach out the company who is uh, uh, providing that food product, and in many time uh, that company may not be aware that there was an issue because, uh, and then the second thing you need to do. If it's a serious enough issue, reach out to the local authorities, depending on where you are. For example, in US, you reach out to local health department or FDA or USDA. USDA for meat product, FDA for non-meat product, um, uh, seafood, you still need to consider FDA. But uh, again, depending on your uh, uh, food product that you consume, you reached out to appropriate agency, they will take action. They will make sure that uh, if there is a recall necessary, the supplier actually initiate the recall. And uh, here, uh, there are some like very big legal issues that uh, companies can get into. For example, if someone gets sick with Listeria, Listeria monocytogeny or Listeriosis, uh, the average cost of Listeriosis uh, per person, if that person need to go to hospital is $1.8 million. So the companies will be responsible for that cost. The million dollar would directly go to hospital and about $800,000 will uh, go to the person who, who got sick because of the consuming contaminated food product. So because of that, uh, companies are very 
uh, proactive. If they see that there is some issue, they try to contain that issue as soon as possible, and they try to take action. But again, uh, it depends where you are and what type of food safety regulations that uh, uh, you are dealing with. Because uh, if food safety regulations are not strict enough, then someone can get into trouble. Uh, by consuming the food product uh, that is contaminated. But one example I want to share with India, Nestle got into big trouble for Maggie incident. Yes. So that's, that's, that's a prime incident that uh, because our system is not very centralized, it is more like uh, uh, each munif municipality is going to handle their own jurisdiction. Now, if food company get into trouble, they can get into trouble with a different municipality and that can result into like a bigger loss for company. So if it's a multinational company, they still have a vested interest to act on those complaints and then uh, make that complaint right. So, okay. so uh, how is uh, threat analysis uh, like TASIP different from HACCP? So again, uh, the concept is very similar, but here we are trying to understand the threat associated with the uh, uh, raw ingredient that might be contaminated. Uh, so like the, the approach that you are going to use will be somewhat different because instead of HACCP, ha HACCP is a hazard analysis that is associated with food safety, but TASCP you are trying to identify the threat associated with uh, product replacement or uh, contamination. So again, the risk analysis will look different in that term because we are not worried about like contamination with uh, salmonella or E. coli in that type of situation. So uh, gray market production is still very pre prevalent all over the world. Uh, why aren't there any stricter measures for this? Well, I can only talk about US regulations uh, here, uh, even for restaurants, you need to buy product that is produced um, or it came from the approved suppliers and approved supplier program uh, need to make sure that uh, that product was produced in some sort of inspected facility. So that issue is not that big here, but recently there were some changes in regulation and now people are allowed to uh, make food product at home and now directly sell it to consumer. So many food companies are struggling with that. Uh, but what I have found that for third party audit supply, uh, third party audits, they are not going to allow any food product that cannot be confirmed that this product came from uh, approved supplier. This product was not pro if if it uh, pro pro product was not produced under license facility, then uh, you may not able to buy that product to produce your own uh, product, and then that can uh, basically prevent companies to buy. Uh, gray market products. And if I'm assuming right, that gray market product is product being produced under uh, under no license and at, at the home level. Okay, yeah. Okay, so probably last question. How is w WTO dealing with food frauds in global trade? Well, for uh, uh, World Trade Organization, um, there are some guidance out there, but uh, to best of my knowledge, they are not as strict or like there are not much information that we utilize here in US because uh, we heavily rely on a third party audit and uh, US regulation. So unfortunately, uh, I don't have the exact answer uh, top of my head that I can share with you, but I'm more than happy to look uh, over some of the uh, WTO's uh, recommendation and then pass it on to you, so. Okay, that would be great, sir. So um, it was a very informative session, sir, and uh, thank you for dealing with all the questions uh, from our participants. And I thank you on behalf of uh, GFSU, on behalf of our director, sir, our HOD, and our uh, general director, Gen uh, Director General, Dr. J.M. Vyas also. And thank you for giving us this time. And it was a very informative session. We learned a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the op this opportunity. And uh, please let us know uh, that if we can be of any help, like as a or like as a university, or you, even like uh, if I can provide anything uh, that can be used at your program, just just don't Definitely. hesitate to reach out. So I think we would yeah. love to collaborate, and we'd love your inputs uh, through the different things we deal with in the food industry. And we'd love for you to share your PPT so that we can give it to the participants because they would definitely sure. want it.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much and take care sir and have a good <laughs> you too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.